the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Last week, I began preaching about the Sabbath day and its significance. And since it's a a lengthy topic with much to say, I decided to break it apart into more than just one sermon. Last week, we looked at the Sabbath day and what it meant and why God instituted it. Today, we're going to consider Christ as the fulfillment and the substance of the Sabbath. And then next week, we'll look at our enjoyment of the Sabbath here and now as a present reality. Now, I understand that it can be difficult to remember sermons from week to week. And so let me spend just a couple of minutes refreshing our minds and then bring us forward to Christ as the substance of the Sabbath. We began last week with our gospel lesson for the 17th Sunday after Trinity last week in Luke chapter 14. We heard about Jesus healing the man with dropsy on the Sabbath day and how that would have offended the Pharisees. He was deemed to have sinned by the Pharisees and even by the letter of the law. Yet by his actions and his words, we see that Jesus, of course, did not sin, but was teaching and affecting something greater, something that was both godly and God-pleasing. As we all know, the original Sabbath was that which began on the seventh day. And I purposefully say that it began on the seventh day because the original Sabbath in the garden was not just a day. God did not rest from his creative act for only one day and then return to his creative act the next day. It wasn't a a one-day weekend for him. It wasn't a sleep in late and catch your breath kind of day for God. Rather, the seventh day marked the beginning of a state of existence and relationship between God and man and even creation to liken it to our own special and appointed days. It would be like a marriage. A wedding day is the day on which a new relationship is formed. Vows are taken and the celebration of that union happens. But we also know that that marriage relationship isn't just for one day on the actual wedding day. The following day, you don't return to your previous life as a single person. You don't go about trying to find a wife or a husband again. Instead, you enjoy your spouse and your new life with all that that entails. Marriage is a new state of existence that goes on in perpetuity, unless, of course, something destroys that relationship. Well, to use that same imagery, and one which is actually woven and expressed throughout the scriptures, God married himself to his people. He fellowshiped and had a relationship with them. He provided for every need and he shared his own dominion with mankind. He communed with them in the cool of the day as we talked about in Sunday school today, giving them to eat of that special and sacramental tree, the tree of life, which provided and preserved their lives eternally as the scriptures say. This was the perpetual Sabbath rest and relationship which began on the seventh day in Genesis. Yet, as we considered, sin destroyed that perpetual Sabbath. In Genesis chapter 3, where we find the sin of Adam and Eve, we read a part of God's judgment. This is what we hear God say in verses 17 through 19 of Genesis chapter 3. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The very curse placed upon man and creation after the fall was that work would now be toilsome and creation would no longer provide in the same way that it once did. Communion with God 
and the life-giving food of the tree of life would literally be blocked by the sword of the cherub. Pain and tiredness would now accompany their work, and death would plague the hearts, the minds, and the very bodies of mankind. The God-provided Sabbath rest that man enjoyed was now destroyed. Sin resulted in a broken and hopeless relationship. But God did not leave man hopeless. God would give them the good news of their promised redemption and restoration. When speaking to the serpent, God says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Genesis 3.15 while Satan would bruise and injure mankind, the promise was that Satan would not just be overcome, but he would be crushed, left powerless to strike at man again. And this is the whole theme of Scripture, of God redeeming and calling his people back into relationship with him, where he would be, as the Scriptures say, their God, and they would be his people. The problem, though, for those before Jesus was that in the course of time-bound history, Jesus Christ had not yet come. It was a promise. It was a hope. But it was not yet a reality. And so the people which God called unto himself were given a continued sign of that Genesis gospel and promise. We read last week in Exodus 31 that God commanded the Sabbath day as a sign of the covenant. The Sabbath day was the sounding horn. Every Sabbath day, when all work ceased, it would proclaim, hold fast, the curse of sin will be broken, and the garden rest and relationship with God is being restored unto you. God is redeeming you, God is at work, and you shall have that rest. Again, to keep with our marriage illustration. The Sabbath day was sort of like how we might view our wedding anniversaries. Our anniversary is a special day when we do special things, isn't it? We go out. We buy gifts. If we have kids, we get babysitters. We go to a, a nice dinner, and we feel guilt-free as we splurge on that 2,000-calorie dessert at the end. <laughs> An anniversary is when we do special things when we share intimate conversations and moments, and we devote ourselves in a different way to our spouse. And it's done in a different way than it is done on every other day. And it's all with the intent of expressing our love and our devotion and our continued relationship with each other. And so in the wisdom of God and for the sake and welfare of man, God commanded that there be a specific and special day whereby he could express to man and whereby man could understand and recognize exactly what he had promised and the love with which he was loving them. That special day was the Sabbath day and the Sabbath day worship of communion with God. That special day and the promise of that special Sabbath day would find it find its fulfillment not in itself, but in the one who was to come. It was a sign. We ended last week reading St. Paul's words in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. And there Paul said this, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is belongs to Christ. What St. Paul was expressing was that the laws and the feasts and the sacrifices and all the various and sundry things found in the Old Testament structure and their worship, they all pointed to Christ. And as the Sabbath sign pointed to the once lost but not yet realized garden rest and promised gospel message of Genesis 3.15, so Christ fulfilled it and became the Sabbath. He was the substance that the day pointed to. In other words, the Sabbath day would no longer be a sign, but would instead become a reality in Jesus. The Sabbath day was a shadow, but Christ was the substance of the Sabbath. And so when Christ was accused of breaking the Sabbath day by the Pharisees, he wasn't at all doing what they claimed. 
If anything, it was the reverse of what they said. Jesus was fulfilling the Sabbath, just as he did throughout all of his earthly ministry and with all of his several miracles. I mean, if we think for a moment what kind of things Jesus did, he healed those who were sick. He multiplied bread and fishes to feed those who were hungry. He turned water into wine. He calmed the storms of the sea. He cast out demons. He commanded fish to fill the nets. He walked on water. He raised dead people, or he raised people from the dead. In all of this, what we see is that one, Jesus had dominion over creation. Two, Jesus gave life to man. Three, Jesus provided provision for man. And four, Jesus walked and communed in their midst. Do you see that correlation? It's the picture of Genesis. It's the picture of the creation account with God and Adam and the garden. Christ overcomes the curse of Eden as he heals, as he redeems, and as he restores the Sabbath rest and fellowship with God. St. Paul embraced this theology when he referred to Jesus in his writings as the second or the last Adam. To make such a statement means that St. Paul had the understanding that in Jesus, creation was made anew. There was a re-creation. And so Jesus couldn't have broken the Sabbath, as the Pharisees claimed, because Jesus was the Sabbath. Jesus even declared himself, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And at another point, Christ speaks with Sabbath imagery, with words which we quote every week in worship. Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, like the curse, and I will give you what? Rest. Notice how Christ attaches the Sabbath rest with himself. And on another occasion, when Christ was accused of working on the Sabbath, Christ answers the Pharisees with this statement. My father and I have been working until now. What Christ means is that from the day that sin entered the world, from the day that the Sabbath rest was destroyed and creation was cursed, God was creating anew. And finally, in the fullness of time, God brought forth Christ into the world to restore and bring the true Sabbath unto them. Think of Christ's words on the cross in light of all of this. On the sixth day, on the same day in Genesis that we're told, or on the same day we're told in Genesis 2 that the heavens and the earth were finished and all of the host of them came also the culmination of Christ's redeeming work for mankind. It was on the sixth day when Christ offered up himself on the cross. And as his redemptive work culminates in his sacrifice, Christ says from the cross, it is finished. The sacrifice that was needed, the death that was needed to satisfy the offense and curse of Eden, the basis for removing the old and bringing in the new was offered. In a very real sense, the original creation, the original heavens and earth came to an end that day on Calvary. Even the signs in the heavens and the earth at the time of his death gave testimony to this. The heavens were darkened, the earth quaked, the rocks were rent, the graves gave up their dead. When Christ died, the veil in the temple also was torn in two. The former things were done away because they were fulfilled in Christ and his work. And when Christ proclaims like God in Genesis, it is finished, what does he do on the seventh day? Where is Christ on the Sabbath day? Is he not rested in the grave? Was he not in the place of departed spirits, Hades, which is what we mean when we say he descended into hell in the Apostles' Creed? He went to those who died of old, who had looked forward to the fulfillment of God's Sabbath promise, but had died before it. And they now rejoice in the presence of that promised Redeemer and Restorer. They enjoyed first, before anyone else, the fulfillment of God's promise of the seed who would crush Satan underfoot, of the one who would break open the gates of the curse of Eden's death that held them therein. Think about that. The old heavens and earth, cursed by the sin of Eden, were done away. 
and Christ Sabbathed. Christ proclaimed, it is finished, and then Sabbathed. But with the passing of the old also comes the new. On the first day of the week after the old week is completed, and the day on which the new begins, Christ rose from the grave. In Christ, the new creation, the creation that God had promised and fulfilled through his death, was now realized. Now, with that thought in mind, let's close our time this morning by turning to the final chapters of the Bible. In Revelation 21 and 22, we find the ultimate revelation of Jesus Christ and his work. And I'm not going to read the entire thing, but let me read some of what St. John writes in those chapters. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, It is done. It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then in chapter 22, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. And there shall be no more curse. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it quite interesting that the Bible starts and ends the same way, with the same descriptions. Have you ever noticed that? Genesis begins with the original creation account and the original Sabbath with man that was destroyed by their sin. And Revelation ends with the new creation and the new Sabbath that we have in Christ who has overcome that curse. You have to understand Revelation 21 and 22 with Genesis 2 and 3 in mind, with our Savior Jesus Christ sitting at the center of both. Beloved, Christ is our Sabbath, and we have obtained our Sabbath rest with God through him. No longer do we need the Sabbath day like the Israelites to proclaim some future hope, because we now have the eighth day, the resurrection day, the first day of the new creation, to proclaim that which he has already done. And it's no longer just a single day of Sabbath enjoyment, but it is a new and perpetual life given unto us for eternity. And to that, we'll return next week. Let us pray. Grant we beseech the Almighty God that the words which we have heard this day with our outward ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of thy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.